welcome everyone uh, to this month's edition of uh, the Louisville Real Estate Investor Meetup Group. We're really excited to see everyone here. Uh, I'm really excited to invite, or we're really excited to invite our guest, uh, Anson Young, to kind of talk a little bit about uh, finding and funding great real estate deals. He actually wrote this book right here, uh, which I'm pretty much with, over with at this point, but it's a really good book. Um, I've, I've, I've read through it. It's, 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 it's a great, great book. Definitely get read. Definitely check it out if you get a chance to. Uh, Luke, do you want to say anything as far as the, uh, anything's concerned? Sure. Um, just hello, everybody. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, I've really been missing meeting up with people in, in, in person. Um, but, uh, but Anson, really excited that you came on. I know I, I saw you talk at the Bigger Pockets conference. Um, and you talked about one thing that stuck with me that I started doing in my marketing was, um, and I think it's really important, but the personal branding idea, and then like, you know, making sure that everything that you send out looks really professional and, you know, having all the pieces on there that, that looks like you're, you're a real legit business rather than like just some, you know, random person sending a postcard doesn't really know what he's doing. You know, I think that's a really important thing just to kind of try to build your brand. And, and I've, I've been kind of implementing that. And I, I think it's, it's worked well for, for me. And, and when I've been meeting with, um, you know, people to try to purchase their properties and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to let you know, I, I really, that was the, the big take home thing that, that it helped my business was that from, from the last time I heard you talk. So when, when Raphael told me that you'd agreed to come on, I was like, man, I'm going to pick up some good stuff this time too. <laughs> so appreciate you coming on though, man. And uh, yeah, that was a, that you had some great tips when last time I heard you. So nice. I'm excited, Thanks, man. To, excited to have you here. Thanks again. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, you go, go ahead, go ahead, Anson. You can take it away at this point. Okay. Yeah. So um so I'll share my screen here in a second, but uh, sure. hello, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks for uh, Raphael and Luke for putting this on. And uh, I do run my own meetup, so I feel the pain of <laughs> not being able to meet in person. And uh, we have uh, five locations in Denver, and they're all at breweries or these cool places. And uh, I love uh, just that in-person networking. And now that we can't do it, uh, having stop gaps like this is a huge help, especially if you're continuing to network and you're continuing to try to learn, um, our, our networking meetup or our, our group's a little bit more laid back. We don't have speakers and all that. So it's like missing out on social hour now. So, um, but okay. So I'm probably going to talk a little fast. I might skip through a couple slides. Can you see the slides there? Or do you just see my desktop? I can, I can see you. I, I got you. you. I see okay, you. Okay, okay, good. Just making sure it's working. Technology, you know. Um, yeah. So I might talk a little fast. I might skip through a couple slides. I'm never going to skip anything that's super important uh, or big takeaways. Uh, Luke uh, has seen some of this already. I'm hoping to now step it up and, and add even more now that he's seen a little bit of this. But, um, but even now more than ever, this kind of stuff is pretty dang important when – the market changes, the market shifted, and now you're dealing with all new market conditions. You have different, uh, different levels of competition. I'm sure if your market is like mine, it is still going crazy, still have low inventory, uh, still have sellers needing to sell, buyers needing to buy. Um, a lot of the investors that you are, uh, that you're here with are still buying, you know, you're, they're, they're still your competition. And so what we're going to talk about is trying to navigate some of that and some ways to stay, set apart from uh, your competition. And, uh, and yeah, so let's, let's get into it. All right. So shift happens no matter what uh, great book that got handed to me right in the middle of the like 2009, 2010 downturn was a book called shift by Gary Keller. And it talks a lot about uh, what to do when the market shifts and how to recognize the patterns of a market shift and how to shift your business before the market gets pulled out from under you. And so uh, that's like kind of my big inspiration for, uh, for, for this presentation. And it was uh, last year when Luke saw me at uh, the Bigger Pockets convention and nobody could have seen, you know, six months later, not even six months later, uh, this kind of stuff happening where uh, so many factors get thrown at us as agents and investors that uh, if we're not ready or we're not nimble on our feet, 
we could easily get wiped out. We could easily uh, change our whole business to the point where, you know, people going bankrupt or they're going out of business because they uh, didn't shift. So my, uh, this is just a quote from uh, my mentor who doesn't know my, he's my mentor, but uh, change is inevitable, growth is optionable. So no matter what you do, change is gonna happen. Uh, whether you decide to grow through that change is totally up to you. So a uh, tiny bit about me. Um, again, I'm in the Denver market. I do fix and flips and wholesales. I am a licensed agent. I'm building out a real estate team. Uh, and I'm definitely the nicest guy I know. So we'll, we'll reuse jokes from last year. Um, so I started in 2005. I actually started in Phoenix, uh, right where Raphael went to school. And uh, my very first deal was a live-in flip. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't exciting. I had no idea what I was doing. And then by 2007, I was back in Denver because unlike Raphael, I actually did not like Phoenix at all. And so I uh, decided to move back, back home. And I got my license that same year. So I own Anson Property Group. Uh, again, fix and flip, wholesale, wholetail, all that fun stuff. And obviously branding is a big piece that Luke talked about. And so this is kind of what I push out to uh, all of my potential uh, sellers, buyers, everybody who knows me sees this on me pretty much at all times. Again, I run a meetup group um, and that's a picture from Bigger Pockets headquarters in a better time when we can actually get, get all together. And so, uh, so I, I definitely feel your pain again. And then we do a uh, kind of a speaking style event and it's a Ted, Ted talk style event. And we've had Mark Ferguson, who is a bigger pockets author. And we've had, uh, we, we've had a few others. We've had to stop obviously due to COVID, but uh, these were very fun to try to, since we don't have speaking on a monthly basis, we wanted to add more value to our members. So that's what the real estate bear is all about. And I wrote this book, Finding and Funding Great Deals. And uh, if you're so inclined, it's on Bigger Pockets, it's on Amazon, uh, it's on Audible if you want to hear this voice talk for nine hours. So we're going to talk about uh, deal finding shift first um, and what still isn't working. Uh, so Luke threw me off a little bit because he's seen some of this. But <laughs> um, so this kind of stuff in my market, um, and I consider us a top, you know, 15 market just because of we have high prices, we have low inventory, we have high competition. Uh, my competition has been sending this out for 10 years and 10 years of people seeing it means that it doesn't work anymore. Uh, these kind of corners actually don't exist in my market due to both it being ineffective and also uh, regulation. Like they don't, they just don't let you put out signs like this. I've probably seen I've probably seen one We Buy Houses bandit sign in the last 18 months. And I haven't seen any since COVID hit. And it's not like, you know, oh, I'm going to go against the trend and put them out and risk the fine because it's effective. I feel like our sellers are savvy enough to not just call some random uh, bandit sign. Obviously, uh, stuff like this is fun, but uh, it would be a complete waste of time in my market. And then some other slogans that I've seen around the inner, the inner webs, um, and yellow letters, which were a staple for a long, long time. They just aren't effective anymore. No matter how many doodles and drawings and stars and check marks and arrows you put on them to make them look exciting, uh, just not a thing that exists, unfortunately. So market marketers ruin everything, and everybody who came before us ruined this for us. So we gotta. We got a shift. And so another thing that doesn't work is only doing one thing. So it used to be a time where you could send out postcards get, you know, 30 deals a year and you're good to go. And then that became 20 and then 10 and then five. And then pretty soon you are sending postcards out for a whole year and you get maybe, maybe one deal a year, maybe the low hanging fruit, but, uh, just hammering one thing only just doesn't work anymore. We got to step up our game. So again, 
nobody here, of course, nobody here in this meetup because you're because uh, you're because you're the smart ones. But most of your competition are not stepping up their game. The really savvy ones are. They're they're doing groups like this. They're going to masterminds. They are actively working to improve their business. I would say the majority of them are kind of stuck in the old school ways. Um, and I think uh, Raphael said that this group tends to be a little bit younger, under 40. And I found that most of my colleagues uh, who are over 50 have a really hard time with, uh, with, with shifting at all. Uh, the, the change is just too much sometimes. So they're stuck sending yellow letters because that's all they know and they don't want to try ringless voicemail or uh, text blasting, any of that kind of stuff. And so I liken the competition to this inverted pyramid where the, at the top you have the most amount of people and they're willing to do the easy stuff. And then at the bottom you have a narrow, you know, you have the narrow point, you have the hard stuff, the hard things in this business. And not a lot of people are willing to do the hard things, but a lot of people are willing to do those easy things. So for an example would be, uh, you know, pulling a list source list from the comfort of your home to get your, uh, to get your mailing list. Let's just say that's easy. Anybody could do that. I could do that from my seat into your market. You know, that's, that's how easy it is. I can't go drive for dollars in the, you know, the desirable areas of Knoxville from where I'm at. So that, that, makes it a little bit harder and a little bit more niche. So not everyone's willing to, to put in that work. And so again, another example would be, you know, the easy thing is just these tired postcards to a beat up list inconsistently. And the hard thing would be to send out high quality, memorable marketing to a niche list very consistently. All right, so that's your competition. One thing when I uh, think of like kind of a, a strategy when it comes to attracting sellers, to my business is uh, when I think of online, I think of it as a trust platform. A lot of people see online as a leads platform, which it definitely is. Um, I think this next one says trust versus leads. And what I mean is, uh, you know, if you're only relying on the leads coming through and you just have a squeeze page that isn't telling kind of a story to these sellers of why they would choose to work with you and your company over your competition. And that sounds touchy feely. It sounds a little um, woo woo, but I promise you that in this day and age when we're all bombarded with, with ads constantly, I mean, right now it's, it's obviously political ads, um, but we're always being sold something and the trust factor into how those, those stories are conveyed, how those ads come across if it makes me want to buy a product because I like the story or I know it's coming from a place of, of integrity or being genuine, then that's huge. That, that sways me. And I'm, you know, I'm a grizzled marketer who can usually see through these things. Uh, your, your average person gets a gut feeling of, you know, this person's just trying to steal my house versus, you know, maybe you have a video on there where you talk about your business and your family and your goals of improving the neighborhoods or, um, you know, you, your favorite thing to do is helping people out and, and, and working through these win-win scenarios. And so those little steps go a long way to then convert to leads. But uh, as I'll talk about here in a minute, sometimes the trust is, is just kind of this unseen factor that goes towards you, you know, buying houses. It might be, they never fill out your form online for your leads. But when you send them a mailer, they check you out online because now everybody pretty much has the internet in their pocket. They're gonna go to your website. They're gonna see, is this a legitimate company? Is this a real person? And then when they call, they feel like you, you, you've already had that first touch. You've already had that kind of uh, warm introduction. And now it's not just a cold call and them just calling you inbound lead, now it's a little bit warmer, a little bit more familiar. So uh, another way to do this, uh, to kind of build on this trust platform strategy would be uh, getting as many testimonials as you can. And of course, real testimonials, we're not, uh, we're not just packing them in for numbers, but 
uh, but but having some genuine testimonials on your on your uh, I know there's a Google Plus symbol there, um, but your your Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, any if you're an agent, you know having agent referrals or agent excuse me uh, testimonials uh, to to help you out to kind of build out that trust platform, and of course reviews. Um, Testimonials would be from, you know, previous clients or previous buyer, excuse me, sellers that you've helped. And the reviews would be um, kind of that more, you know, it's not just like, hey, Raphael, uh, you know, I loved working with Raphael's company. Um, he really helped us through this hard, hard situation. And it's kind of a, maybe a longer uh, minute and a half video or something that you get their permission to get. And that's a testimonial, whereas a review would be, obviously a review, everybody's has uh, left a Google review or a Yelp review. And, um, and this just helps, uh, helps build out that trust platform. So when you put it all together, uh, the bottom piece I didn't talk about here, but it's more about content um, and just kind of having your content everywhere. Uh, you know, you snap in reviews, testimonials, and then having good content where people feel like they can you know, get a feel of where your company's at, what you're doing, and and what your voice is, and maybe your story. And then when they do pick up the phone to call, you have these three things working for you. And most of the time, you only had to do these things once. You know, you had testimonial from uh, from Bob, which was a you know review from Sue, and then good content on your page. And those things are working for you at all times when people go to check that out. And I don't know, maybe. My market's just so weird, but I do see when I send out mailers, you know, three days go by and I can see a web traffic spike every single time. And that just means people get my mailer and no matter how good it is, they're going online and they're checking me out. So in order to, uh, in order, you know, let's just say that that's going to happen every time that I want to have that all in place so that when they do come and check me out, they feel comfortable, they feel like they can trust me and they want to call because, uh, because I made them feel so good when they came into basically my world. And so um, these are the goals for the trust platform, you know, brand presence, being comfortable, showing that you're legitimate, and then obviously just being a normal, regular person uh, as much as possible, familiar, relatable. And that goes into, you know, this could be like the first step to building rapport. And I'll talk about that here in a second. I'm going to kind of scam, scan over the, uh, the deal examples. Um, if you want more information, just hit me up and I'll send you these slides. But, uh, but for the sake of time, I can already tell that I'm, I'm blabbing my mouth here, but I'm going, going a little bit slow. But uh, this is one of those examples of people who have a little bit of rapport before they call you. I've, I have, I've heard from sellers who are like, oh, I saw that video where you were cleaning out that hoarder house. That's crazy. My house isn't anywhere near like that. But, uh, but man, it's crazy how people can live that way, right? And you have like this in without having to do anything. Obviously, I had to shoot a video and put it up on YouTube. But I, it, it's this automatic rapport building uh, that can happen just from stuff that you have out there as your trust platform. All right, website. All right. So this continues to be one of the biggest things that um, not a lot of investors are looking at. Not a lot of, you know, the, the, again, like the really savvy ones are. And if you've heard about it before, great. We'll talk about it more. If you haven't heard about it, which is what I usually find, um, when we talk about direct mail, when you stack lists and you stack your marketing. So uh, number one rule of direct marketing, just so you know, is consistency. My rule of eight is that we're not going to be one and done. We're not just going to grab a list of 10,000, mail to it once, and then decide that it wasn't, you know, we didn't get the results that we wanted and then quit. That's, that's not really marketing. That's just kind of wasting your money. If you want to do that, if you want to spend that money, just send it to Raphael. He will take your money <laughs> and he will put it to good use. Um, Luke will buy some toys uh, for his kids. And, uh, 
you know, it, it, it's basically, if you're not willing to do eight months of consistent marketing, then don't even do it once because the magic happens at like four and five and six. And then by the time seven and eight comes around, you're going to renew it and you're going to keep, keep going. And then the, the snowball will be pushed down the hill. So keep that in mind. All right. These are what I call your basic lists. Everybody has access to these. Um, some are a little bit harder than others, but in general, uh, you can go to list source, grab a high equity list. Five minutes later, you have 10,000 names in an Excel spreadsheet and you're ready to go. Um, these, of course, we do poll, but we want to go a little bit, we want to go a little bit deeper. So we're going to set these aside. We're going to actually call these the, uh, we're going to call these the master list. And so everybody has a master list. We all tend to market towards the lowest hanging fruit, which is uh, typically these lists. But we're going to go after some uh, much more harder and niche lists. And this is where we'll find less competition and better bang for our buck. Um, and now that everybody here knows about it, uh, it's going to just get more competitive, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, but, it, but, you know, all joking aside, uh, this, really, this really ties into this kind of super list concept where um, nothing changed. We just moved all those up. Now, what we want to do is with all of our lists, we're gonna throw it all into a master list and we're gonna say, okay, who on these lists actually exists on multiple lists? Who here is an absentee, um, high equity, uh, driving for dollars lead? You know, this, this guy lands on three lists. Do you think the guy that lands on three lists is a little bit more willing to sell or maybe the, the need to sell is more urgent, you know, inherited family transfer and it's a divorce and they're in pre-foreclosure. It's not just one of those things. Uh, it's, it's three of those things. And obviously the more lists, the more, uh, unfortunately desperate, usually these people are to sell. So let's say all of our lists, our big fat master list has 5,000 people on it. Now, the goal here is to stack this list so that we can just squeeze it out and we're going to only find the people who end up on multiple lists. So let's just say, uh, two, you know, a thousand of these people are on two lists. They might be on a pre-foreclosure list and a high equity list. 500 people are on three lists, 200 people on four lists and so on. There's one unfortunate guy who's on all nine lists. Um, he's dead and divorced and in foreclosure and all of these other things. And, but, so as you can see, the more lists that someone would be on, the more, the less total people would be on that list. And so do you think, you know, let's just take the four list. I think that that's kind of a sweet spot four and above. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, and even threes, I think threes are good too, but fours and above, do you think that we want to pay special attention to these? We're not just going to roll them into a regular, you know, even though our monthly marketing just kicks ass, uh, it's amazing. But do you think that we want to pay a little bit more special attention to these guys? And, uh, and I can't hear any of you because you're all on mute, but I'm assuming that you're screaming yes at the top of your lungs. Uh, we'll just assume that. And you yes, did right. Yeah. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We, we did it. Um, okay. This might be a slide that got accidentally thrown in. Oh, it was. All right. So what I do with my super list, and that's the people on four lists and more, is I don't just mail them. I will skip trace them. I will mail them. I'll target them online. I'll cold call them. I'll door knock them. I'll ringless voicemail. I will do a stacked marketing approach on my super list because it's going to, it's basically, if you put, if you put 80% of your effort into your, um, into, into this approach, you're, you're taking these people who are on multiple lists and you're, and you're, you're hitting them until they basically say, go away or they sell you the house. And 
you're being super aggressive with them for a reason because you can step in and help them because they obviously have four, five, six, or seven problems that they really need to deal with. And you could be that person to help them. So obviously there are people who take this approach on their whole list of let's just say 5,000. And for most people, including myself, that's just not feasible. If I focus on just these people who need it the most, that's where I'm finding most of the deals is because that extra effort onto these smaller lists actually produces more deals than just the mailing every month to the big list, if that makes sense. All right. So a couple, um, let's see, make sure I got these right. So these were all on, on multiple lists. Um, and basically some of these, nobody else was talking to them. So if you want to talk about beating out your competition, if you're the only person talking to them, do you think you beat everybody out? And of course that answer is yes. Um, this one has been on a vacant list for 20 years. It's been vacant. So this guy, um, this guy's wife died and he moved out. He just moved out. He moved like an hour away. And this pro this house has just been sitting there. It was like walking into a time capsule. I should have included interior shots, but how many mailers do you think he got for 20 years of being a non-owner occupant house? And it's not like it was rented. It's not, it was basically just, he locked the door and left. Um, which is crazy. I, I like crazy stories, but how many mailers do you think he got in 20 years from investors? And I'm sure that I mailed him, you know, for five years up until I kind of found better ways to contact people. Um, I think he landed on, uh, I think he landed on one or two more lists. I think he got behind on his taxes and, oh shoot, I should know this. Um, he, anyways, he landed on my three list. And so I went after him pretty aggressively. So instead of just mailing him every month, um, I was calling a cell phone, skip traced him, found uh, some relatives online, contacted them, uh, basically did everything that I can to get in front of this gentleman. And so instead of just throwing in another mailer into his pile of mailers, uh, I, I did the extra steps because I knew that he needed my help more now than ever. It's been vacant for 20 years, but now he's got compounded issues. Let's see. Um, so uh, George was more of a, he liked my branding. Um, some of these got a tiny bit mixed up just due to uh, cutting this down for time. But um, so as you can, and, and I think some of the other stuff that I, that, that I want to touch on is, uh, hold on, let me, let me, let me gather my thought here. Um, get a drink. And like, like Luke said, uh, part, you know, another part of the strategy that's not in here, but if you ever want to know more about it, just hit me up is, um, is just making sure that you're in order to stand out from your competition, that you're not sending out exactly what your competition sending out. Now we've all been to houses where that we've bought or that are vacant and that you can see, you know, a lot of times the sellers will just be like, Hey, look at all this mail that I've been getting, you know, Hey, can I, can I take a look at that? Do you mind? You know, I, I like to see what, what people are doing. And, you know, I, then I try to feel them out to see why they maybe called me over, you know, the literal, you know, 20 other mailers that they have. And actually, let me go back to here. Yeah. So th this, this would be an example that would tie in, but, um, and so I get to go through the mail. I get to go through, uh, you know, with their permission, of course, the postcards, the, the we buy ugly houses, the, the I buyers, um, Zillow offers, uh, get to go through every single piece of mail to see what my competition's doing. And so far I haven't run into anything like what I'm doing. And that's not too hard. I mean, if everybody's sending yellow letters and pink postcards, maybe send a, uh, a professional letter that has handwriting on it as well. You know, that, that's the kind of outside the box. Um, everybody seems to be kind of stuck. And I did this the other day. I went through an investor friend of mine, got a whole grocery bag full, full of mailers from, uh, from, a, from a seller that just handed it to him, said, here you go. 
and we went we went through them together and 95 percent of them are all the same thing it's all the same postcards it's all the same you know fake handwriting that looks really bad um and so it's not that hard to, to, to stand apart from your competition when you just step up in quality and maybe just a little more attention to details and design and and uh and sometimes I'll get letters from insurance agents or window sellers, and I'll take cues from those because I don't see those in the real estate world of, of what they're doing, whether it's, um, you know, having a picture of the house on the envelope or having, uh, I, I like that blend of the professional letter with the personal touch. So people see the professional letter, they see that you're legit, they're like, oh, this is letterhead, you know, this looks like. You know, this person knows what they're doing, which is the, you know, which is the point. But then there's a, then there's a touch on the bottom. That's like, Hey, I look forward to, you know, I look forward to talking to this, you know, talking to you about this, or I look forward to you, your call, call me anytime, you know, and then put your phone number. And so there's, you know, printed letter on letterhead with a nice little handwritten touch. And, uh, and I always have an envelope that looks nothing. I mean, it's, Usually they're just crazy, crazy colors and patterns. I'm pretty sure my open rate's 100%. Now, if I can just get my call rate uh, up to 100%, we'd be all right. But that's just the way it is. But um, this this goes to show that George, he owns seven properties in a really hot area. Um, I mean, an area that's like two blocks from Bigger Pockets HQ, and that's like really, really gentrified. Everything's being torn down. Um, as you can see, the bottom picture you know, it's, it's a crappy duplex, you know, a kind of so-so house. And then it's like this modern row home. And, you know, these other two sell for under 400 where that row home probably sold for 850 or more. So super hot area. This guy's got seven properties and he's getting, oh shoot, let me see if I can remember. Uh, he was getting like seven letters a day or excuse me, seven letters a week per property. Um, so basically one a day per property. So he's getting 50 letters a week. Can you imagine getting 50 letters a week and just like throwing them all away? Because, you know, who's who's going to stand out? It's kind of like the bandit sign corner, right? Which sign are you going to call? <laughs> and to me, none of them look legit. And they all just look like something I'd drive by, even if I had to sell. Um, and this is the same thing for George he was getting 50 letters a week. Which one is he going to call? You know, he's been getting these for years. He's owned these properties for like uh, 25 years or so. So who's he going to call? Well, he called me for the very first time I mailed him and I mailed him on the duplex on the bottom there. And, and he was just like, Hey, it's like, I really liked your envelope and I liked your logo, man. He's like, what are you all about? And I got, I got that in, whereas all my yellow letter competition, on my pink postcard competition and all the guys who were just half-assing it did not get a chance to talk to George. And I got to talk to George and we got to work together on a couple deals. So that just goes to show that, uh, that the quality and the, a little bit of attention to detail really matters. Okay. So I my last point is on masterminding. So especially in these times, this is actually perfect. Um, I've been doing this for a few years about three, four years now. And I really looked at my Facebook group. Um, just everybody who's a friend of mine on there. Uh, I don't have as many as some others, but you know, 2000 friends, it's a lot of friends. And I'm very picky of, of who friend requests I'll accept just because I don't want my feed just absolutely run over with uh, stuff I don't want to uh, deal with every day. But I really took a look at it and I said, who who on here is in a market that's like mine, right? So uh, a comparable ma market to Knoxville might be uh, a couple states away, you know, a, uh, a, a capital or, or secondary market, similar size, similar demographics, similar problems, you know, similar issues, similar competition levels, inventory levels, all that stuff. And so for me, it was, you know, Portland, Boston, uh, Seattle, some of these markets uh, are very similar to mine. I mean, very, very, very close. And so I looked on my Facebook and I said, you know what? Um, 
I'm going to try and leverage my network. I'm going to see if, it, like, and, and, the, and the whole point of it, the whole reason that this happened was I started getting told no when I started trying to meet with local investors. I started, I started trying to say, hey, can I take you out to lunch? I'd love to pick your brain about X, Y, Z in the market. And up until a point, I, I was getting yeses. We were having lunches, met some great friends, uh, shared some great information. And then I started getting told no. Basically, everybody that I started to talk to was very close to the, to the vest. They didn't want to give away their secret sauce. You know, they thought that I was there to, uh, to get them or something, you know? And so, and I got, I got kind of frustrated. I was like, I'm on this great, you know, I'm on bigger pockets. I'm very, uh, very plugged in there and I'm on Facebook. I'm very plugged in with the investor community all across the nation. If I can't talk to these local guys, maybe I can talk to some of these other guys. And so here I am, this is kind of my reach in the nation right now. And so I found that my reach was actually this. And so I started calling, I started just messaging like, like, Hey, would you want to jump on a call this week? Maybe for 20 minutes, I'd love to, I'd love to pick your brain. And if I can help you in any way, um, you know, we can just share information. And I got almost no turndowns at all. Everybody was very cool. Obviously, if you're, if you're on there and you're posting crazy stuff, maybe they may not want to talk to you. Uh, I try to, uh, I try to keep it to adding value and, you know, keeping updated with my family. And so, you know, a lot of these people were absolutely. And so we jumped on calls and I swear I learned more in those 20 minutes than I've pretty much learned in any mastermind, anybody that I met locally. If I talk to Tucker or somebody in Portland, I can have a conversation where it goes, I'm going to send you exactly what I'm mailing out. And then he's going to send me what list he's sending people to, because we're not direct competition at the end of the day. I'm not planning to go to Portland anytime soon. It's actually a lateral move. It's like just as much competition, just as high prices, just as low of inventory. He's having the same problems that I'm having. Maybe I'm doing something that works for his business. And maybe he's doing something that works for my business. So as long as you're going into it with a, a spirit of sharing and obviously uh, reciprocal, you know, give and take. Uh, these relationships have lasted four years and these are people who have gone out and visited. Uh, we've had, you know, tons of great calls over the years and the, the amount of trading and sharing of information has been huge. And so I would, I would encourage you, local groups are great. Obviously I run one, uh, Luke and Raphael run one that you're part of, but uh, you'll, you'll, you'll really find a lot more information from people in that other market who are going through the same things that you're doing that, that you're going through. And since you're not direct competition, you know, you're not a commercial agent there competing with Raphael. Maybe, uh, maybe you can find a commercial agent outside of there. And then those people are much more willing to talk to you. So, um, so hopefully that all got across, but like, um, Honestly, when I expanded my network and to nationwide, things got so much better. I, I suddenly had information from 10 different markets that were working in very similar markets and it was huge. So, all right. So I think that that's, that's it. I probably went a little bit over on time, but um, hopefully nobody minds, but you could always reach out to me. Uh, my bigger pockets profile, uh, hit me up on Instagram or Facebook and, um, and yeah, I really, really, really want to say thank you to letting me have this platform and, uh, and hearing me out. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Anson. I, I learned a ton. I, I, that's really great in, in, insight. Um, so uh, as far as the, the questions go, generally speaking, at, at this point in time, we would essentially open up to questions. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, feel free to, feel, feel, feel free to ask. And I'll be checking Facebook as well. So, I know, I know, Anson. Sweet. One of the questions that we get a lot, just from people that are new, is about marketing and marketing costs uh, for starting up, and and like mm -hmm. how to people want to find deals. You talk about the methods, and I think the stacking list and everything that you talk about is 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 excellent stuff. Uh, I know that the houses when I ended up buying them, 
and and I'm, I never um, ever did that before. But when I look back after uh, I heard you talk about that before, um, I saw that several of those properties were on multiple lists, and I didn't even realize it, you know, because I'd never even heard of that before. So I think that's a great point. But people want to know, like, what kind of I think a lot of people ask me, like, what kind of budget should they be having in mind for for getting started, you know, in in marketing? Because we do have some newer people, I think, on the on the call. And what would you say to somebody somebody just starting out? Like, how how much money should they be thinking about spending to to start a marketing campaign? Yeah, so I think that ties into like the rule of eight is uh, so instead of if you have a list of ten thousand, let's just say, you know get that list down to, uh, well, hold on. So if it's, so if it's 10,000, spend it in your budget's 10,000, let's just say, let's just keep this easy. Um, you can mail that list once, or you can mail a thousand of them 10 times. 10 times yeah. And of course, uh, my philosophy is the, the, you know, list, the 1,000 10 times and make sure that they are, you know, if you can stack those lists and get really quality, uh, great leads on there then that's perfect but but yeah i guess i guess your starting budget you know every it's different for everybody if, even if it's you know 50 dollars a month that you can throw at it right um try to set up so that you can do it consistently for you know six to eight months and then figure out how many you can send for 50 dollars a month and and honestly uh you just never know what you're going to get you might get some you know you might get a killer deal that first month or, or it might be till you know, month four that you're actually getting traction and callback. Uh, but that consistent effort and you're, you're actually going out and doing it where a lot of people, you know, go, it's, it's only 50 bucks a month. What can I do? I'm not going to do anything. And so right. I would say just get started no matter what. And then, yeah, make sure that you're consistent with that. Yeah. And the consistency, I know, um, the deals I've gotten never came from the first postcard for me. It was always multiple. So, uh, or, or I wish, man. Letters, so. I know, I but that's a, that's a great tip that the consistency is so important. So cool. But we, even, we the moral of the story there to me is even $50 a month could get you a deal if you're consistent. Um, and I totally agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Hey everybody, this is Lakiba in Atlanta. How's everybody? Great. Hey, how's it going? Good. Awesome. Hey. Thanks for tuning in. Absolutely. Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate that. So I am a real estate agent, have been for many, many years now. And I started out in the Florida market when I'm not sure if you know about Boontown, where you was getting all the leads from them. Great resource. I switched brokers, moved to the Atlanta market, and I've been doing well, but all of my sales have been word of mouth and I'm trying to really get more into like how do I find the property how do I get to the lead generation every lead generation program I try to get into it's too expensive you got to put three four thousand dollars down pay a thousand dollars a month it's like wait whoa that's just too much and I don't even know how to go and get like the list when people die divorce all of that so I'm kind of stuck out here for word of mouth though it's good but I know there's a greater level yeah, so this is more on the agent side, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, what I would say is, uh, and it's it's different for every market. Obviously, Knoxville uh, could be totally different from Atlanta, but uh, typically, some of these, and and again, these are some of them are pretty hard to find lists uh, in my market. I could either buy obituary lists um, from the from the city, actually. Uh, but they're expensive. They're like $5 per name and there's no guarantee that there's real estate uh, in the estate. And so uh, that's a huge waste of money, obviously. But uh, but if you, um, so yeah, so depending on your market would be how to find those lists. But typically uh, a lot of those are based on court cases. So obviously evictions, uh, probate, um, divorce, these all trigger court cases. So depending on where you're at, usually the first place you'd go would be either to the courthouse or right now it might just be online and see if there's a way to either get those lists for free, see how much they cost. Uh, there are ways to request lists from the government uh, by using a freedom of, freedom of Information Act request. And so 
that's a little bit more complex, but there are like anything that's in public record, uh, the government technically has to give you. Um, now, how many hoops do you have to jump through to get there? Uh, it depends, but these lists are, uh, they're out there, they're hard, harder to find. Something like a pre-foreclosure list is typically easy because they have to publish that information in either a paper or online. And so usually you can go to the county site and see, uh, you know, look up your county um, and then foreclosure records. And then to, just to see if you can uh, find them directly on the county website, which we can do here too. And uh, they come out every Wednesday, I think. And so every Wednesday there's a new crop of foreclosure filings and you know, it's public record because they have to notify all the creditors, you know, of this event that's happening in case anybody needs to come and uh, claim, you know, claim their stake in that pie. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that, that helps a little bit when it comes to being an agent, obviously there's a little bit different factors there, uh, like who you can and can't market to maybe in your market. And then, um, but yeah, it should be pretty similar to investors. You're kind of going after the same people and you're trying to help them just in a little bit different way. Yeah. And I want to get more on the investing side. I mean, I, I love real estate. Don't get me wrong, but I want to be more on the investing side, but it's difficult to get on the investing side. Like, uh, like now I'm getting ready to buy a property. I got to put 20% down. There's no way to get around that, that I know of, you know, my mortgage broker is telling me 20%. That's it. And the most you might drop to is 15%. So. You, yeah. yeah I mean, you, once you, you get the burrs, <laughs> the burr investing, if you can buy, buy something well under value, fix it yeah. up and refinance it. That's, that's the only way you can get away with under 15% down. Have you heard of that before, Lakiba? Um, I'll say that one more time. The burr <laughs> investing, which is buy rent or buy renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. I have not heard of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Brandon Turner wrote a book. Was it Brandon Turner wrote a book on it, Anson? Uh, no, it was. Uh, um, no, it was David Green. Yeah, David, David Green. That's right, David yeah. Green. Mm -hmm. There's a book uh, that David Green wrote on that. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, the, the premise works well. I mean, you'd you'd essentially buy a property that was slightly under value, fix it up, and then as long as the appraised value came back above whatever you put into it, and it was eighty twenty still, you could essentially take out the money. Uh, that you put in the property and do that. I know Luke's done it quite a few times. Um, yeah. So he'd definitely be a good person to talk to about that. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate the advice. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in from Atlanta. That's awesome. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Renee uh, at was asking, do you mind sharing your skip tracing resources or what do you use as far as? Yeah, skip sure. Um, so typically we're doing batch skip tracing. So it'd be, you send them a list and then a certain amount of time later, you get the list back and it's all skip traced. Um, and that typically the batch services don't just do one-offs, but a service like IDI. So that's uh, IDI. And I think it's just IDI.com. That's IDI what we Core, use. I IDI oh. Core. Okay. Um, we use them for batch. And then if you're just doing one-offs, I think Spokio is still uh, still pretty good. Um, they 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 all essentially do pretty much the same thing. They're going through credit data and and pulling out all the good stuff that you need. And so uh, so batch obviously you'd be sending out um, an entire list. So if you have a thousand names and you want to skip trace the whole thing, uh, there's services for that. And then if you're just like, hey, I drove by this property on the way home, and I want to know who lives there. And, uh, you know, or I want to mail them or it looks abandoned. I want to buy it. And you just have one name. There's a way to do that too. So Spokio, I think is a good way to do that. I, I have a quick question. Have you ever used like a list broker or anything like that to be able to compile different lists? I've, I have, honestly, I've probably bought every kind of list from every kind of person I can get, a, get my hands on. Um, and, and they can be good. Sometimes they're just reselling you know, they might have a better uh, list source account than you and uh, and get it for cheaper and they're just marking it up. And so a lot of the times uh, there's that. And then all the way down to just the craziest, you know, there are some list services that are like, 
$18,000 a year and you get 25,000 names and they're all like stuff that you couldn't normally search for. It's kind of this deep credit stuff of, you know, are they in debt? And then certain spending patterns that trigger an algorithm that tell you if they're more likely to sell. Like, so you can go from just pulling something online to all the way down to all the way down the rabbit hole. And so, uh, so I've, I've played in the middle there. I haven't paid 25 grand or 18 grand for a list yet, but, uh, but I know people who have, and, uh, they have names and people who I've, you know, they might, they might be on my list, but, uh, but most of them probably aren't. So craziness. Yeah. Hey, Hanson, um, I had a question for you. I've actually heard of stack list before, but, um, okay. never actually pursued it much. I guess I'm kind of curious, kind of the, the practical question of how do you go about that? I understand the concept. But what's the mechanics right. behind it? Yeah. So, uh, so there's, Thanks for your question, Mike. Um, so there's two real, two real ways to do it. Uh, I started off with just using Excel and kind of, I, I come from a tech background, but I'm not that, not that savvy anymore. But, uh, but basically learning the basics of trying to do a lookup table and see who is showing up multiple times, either by first name and last name, or uh, maybe the property address is showing up multiple times. And that worked, you know, I, I hacked, you know, hacked my way through, uh, through that. And then, um, I did hire a, you know, kind of a Excel wizard off of fiverr.com. And if, if you're not familiar, it's just people who do freelance jobs for $5. Uh, typically it's more, but it used to all be $5 to build me out something like that because I only know so much about Excel and I can't spend 20 hours on that project. And so I did have someone build me out a spreadsheet kind of generator that would look at multiple spreadsheets and do exactly that. And it, and it was more efficient for sure. So that's, that's one way to do it. Obviously none of these ways are super easy. The next way is easy, but not cheap. So there's two services that I know of that, um, that you could pay to do this. And they're based, honestly, the back end, it's all data. So they're just running it through a Microsoft access, you know, database program or something. Um, and so openletters.com, uh, my friend, Justin over there, uh, they, I think that they now have like a CRM that does it. So you can actually upload all of your, uh, all of your lists into it. And then it's pretty easy to get your stacked lists out of there. And then the other one I'm hesitant to recommend number one, cause I can't exactly remember the name, but it was something like $99 a month or something, which was ridiculous for stacking lists. I mean, you could easily hire someone on Fiverr for maybe 20 bucks to do this. And then it's yours and you don't have to pay hundred bucks a month. Um, but I think that that was like, oh man, I know the guy who owns it. I just can't remember the name of the, the service and it's something I've never used, but I know it's out there. I am hesitant to recommend it cause I haven't used it. I've definitely used uh, Justin. Um, Silverio, who runs Open Letter Marketing, and his uh, stack, his stack works really well. But on the back end, it's all just the same uh, lookup tables and the stuff that those Microsoft nerds do. So, uh, I, so I hopefully it helps. I know it's not easy. I wish I had like a, I wish I had just like, hey, go download this thing, and it's super easy. But uh, but unless you know Excel, it's not all that easy. It's not all that intuitive. Well, I, I love the fact you said Fiverr. Like, I, I can't live without Fiverr. So, I mean, if you have the list, I mean, you, <laughs> I'm assuming you could find it on Fiverr. You know, you just get all those five or six or seven lists together and just say, hey, look, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, I mean, you could use Fiverr. You could yeah. use uh, – there's various other freelance sites out there where you can kind of yep. explain exactly what you want, and I'm sure they can get it done for relatively cheap. So, uh, all Yeah, right. and I would, I would have them do – not just a one-time solution, but have them do a solution that you could use over and over again. And so you might pay a little bit more upfront. You might pay 50 bucks or even a hundred bucks, let's just say tops. Uh, but then you have something on your computer that, that you can tell it each time, like, Hey, go look at these 10 lists and, and filter them down to my stack list. 
And then the next month you might snap into more lists. And, uh, and so instead of going back to the service and going, Hey, I need these 12 lists now done. And then these 14 lists now done having something that you might pay a little bit more for, but you can keep forever is ideal for sure. Yeah. And I, I know Anthony, you were saying how you, you, you wished it, it was something that was easy, but, um, what I hear, and, and I'm sure some of you maybe thought the same thing is things that are harder are always going to be where the opportunity is. So if you can make, if you can figure out how to make it work, that's, that's where you're going to have opportunity. And that's why, you know, this stack list idea is a great, you know, great idea. Hope some of, you know, myself included, some of us take advantage of it. <laughs> so appreciate all the tips. So definitely. And, and so we'll, we'll yeah. we have one more question with uh, Olivia. She's asking, uh, Oh, Hey, Olivia, by the way, uh, what are some good books to read on analyzing a deal? And, and this is a separate question that I can answer, but are there any zoom meetings where they role play? So we, we don't, we haven't had the zoom meeting where we role played. We actually had Sterling white, um, come visit us in November and we did a live role play in person. Uh, but I'm sure in the coming months, uh, we may have an opportunity to do something similar, uh, with the speaker. It's just, uh, it all depends, but, uh, Anson, you want to answer, I guess, some of your uh, best books on analyzing deals, obviously your book is one of them <laughs> or. Yeah. Oh, of course. Um, now I, uh, it depends on what you, exactly what you want to do. If you're, if you're looking at rentals, um, I tend to stay within the BP universe just because the, I know that the quality is there and I've read most of them. Um, I do have some older uh, property rental books, um, but I, I feel like they're a little bit outdated. So if you're looking at, if you're looking at rentals, I would definitely hit up uh, the Burr book or the, the book on rental properties by Brendan Turner. If you're looking at flips, uh, Jay Scott's book just got re up, got refreshed. And I know he's going to be on the meeting next month. Uh, right, Raphael? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he he says yes. Okay. <laughs> I caught him when he was muted. Um, <laughs> so, so when it comes to just pure fix and flips, I think that his book goes in really granular detail on those. And uh, my book definitely goes into analyzing deals, of course, uh, rehab, um, ARV, all that good stuff. Uh, it is uh, it is pretty much more general, so it does touch on fix and flips. It touches on uh, on rentals, of course. But yeah, so I think I think between those three books or four books, I guess uh, you should be pretty good. Uh, they all go into analyzing deals, and it's and it's all about the numbers for sure. So, and and I'll also recommend one more Gary Keller's book, awesome as well. So if you get a chance to check that out. Um, it's oh also yeah, the good. the blue book. The blue book. Yeah. The, yeah. Millionaire real estate investor. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's, that's definitely great. a good book. I, I feel like it's aged well. Um, so. Awesome. I'm going to check Facebook as well to see if there's any other questions. Because we're running right on 7 p.m. So do we, any, anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask Anson? All right. Well, Thanks everyone for attending. Really, really happy to see everyone uh, continue to show up to these meetings and engage. And thanks again, Anson, for stopping by. I think you provide a ton of value. And for all those of you who are listening on Facebook and even here, this will be recorded as well. So you guys can check it out uh, anytime, you know, so definitely consume the content and yeah. Luke, do you have anything else you want to kind of say to, before we wrap up? Yeah, not much, not much else to add. Um, but Anson, man, really, really appreciate you taking your time and coming out coming out tonight to talk to us and uh always always good to to hear from somebody that has so much experience as you do so thank you so much yeah thanks you thanks guys for having me uh this is awesome you guys have a great group so definitely and check out his book do it <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. All right all guys right. well it was great seeing you all we'll see ya bye everybody bye. thanks great bye. call oh, bye <laughs>